In one of the most anticipated decisions of the year, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage. The justices heard arguments on two issues, whether same-sex marriage is a constitutional right, and if not, do states have to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states? Those questions come from challenges to gay marriage bans in Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. This means same-sex marriage is legal across the country, and the states with bans in place have to reverse course. What do we have? The decision is a big win for same-sex marriage advocates, and it comes two years after the Supreme Court struck down a significant part of the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA. There are currently 36 states and the District of Columbia that allow same-sex marriages, whether they enacted those policies on their own or were forced to by federal court rulings. 14 states still have bans. For Newsy, I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn. You ever thought that there are people that have gone to hell today that never thought they would go there? I mean, they might have thought they would go there, but they never really believed that they would go to hell. They never actually knew what hell was going to be like. They never actually believed that they would someday go there. They probably thought they were good, you know. I mean, after all, they're Christians. Of course they never thought they were going to go there, but they're there right now. Many of them cursing God because some preacher told them that God was love and that love was tolerance and that God would never make them feel condemned. Ever heard the phrase, a little sugar makes the medicine go down? More like a little truth makes deception acceptable. I want to be very clear on something. I have a heart for every soul lost and saved. But this video, from the very first idea of it until the very last edit that I made, was made for church people. I've spoken out in the past, and I think it's funny because a lot of church people have come up to me and they say, you're going to turn all the lost people off, or you're going to make sinners want to have nothing to do with you. They miss the whole point. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to church people. The people that already think they believe in Christ. The people that serve in churches. The people that evangelize the lost. The people of the church. You know, I'm going to tell you something. It is an absolute, no second question, no explanation, no hearing of your life story, impossibility for you to be saved and yet live in a continuous state of worldliness. And you say things like, God will forgive me. God has been with me since I was a kid. After all, I got saved a long time ago. Surely he will just forget about all this. And you say things like that, but you keep on doing all of the evil you can. You intentionally indulge in your favorite sin, and while there's still time to stop, while there's still time for you to just think about it and say, no, I don't want to do it. In the same breath you say, boy, I'm sure glad God is merciful. But Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, looks down from heaven and he says, do you have any idea what your forgiveness cost me? I had flesh torn off my neck and back and legs. I had a crown of thorns jammed into my head. I was stabbed in the side. Gore gushed from my hands and from my feet and from my back just to cover the thing that you were so lightly indulging in. But in truth, these things that I went through in the physical, they were nothing compared to what I was going through in the spiritual. If you multiplied all of these physical things that I had gone through times a thousand, it still could not cover your one sin. Don't you know... That God the Father beat me to pieces. He obliterated me beyond recognition. He took the cup of wrath that had your name on it and he splashed it onto my perfectly sinless and bleeding face. And what's worse is that God did this to me with a smile. It pleased him to crush me for you. That's what your forgiveness cost me. Most professing Christians have never realized their actual need for Christ. They've been invited to come to Him in such a way that it seems like, well, I'm doing God a favor just to believe in Christ. They've never been told that the very first level of Christianity is a complete denial of all of your desires and of everything that you've ever been. They've not been clearly shown that whosoever does not wake up in the morning and die to every one of his desires is not even worthy of walking in Jesus' footsteps. They don't understand that being a Christian means that they are crucified to the world and that the world is crucified to them. That means that the world thinks of you as a fool that has nothing to contribute to society and that there is nothing that the world offers that you could desire. That you now have nothing to do with sin 
and everything to do with God. It hasn't been told to very many professing Christians that Jesus said and meant, no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and you will love the other every time. If you do not mind it very much when people use his glorious name in vain, if you do not mind being seen in places that were built to be places of sin, if you do not feel deeply offended at the fornications in your favorite movies, at the scoffing of the glorious name of Jesus, and at jokes that defy his very throne and slap his face in rebellion, then you hate him. And it's really not hard to figure out because Jesus said, you will hate one and love the other always. If you love the world, you hate him, or else Jesus was wrong. But you say, no, that ain't true. I love Jesus. Jesus is Lord. But who are you trying to convince? Isn't it interesting when anyone brings a word of correction about your sin, you immediately pass them off as unchristlike and judgmental. It's disgusting that it's more of a scandal in this church culture to reprove sin than it is to laugh at it. The one who says sin is wrong is judgmental, and the one who commits it and encourages others to do it is Christ-like. How disgusting. You don't want to be like God. You just want people to back off when they start reproving the thing that you were the most in love with. True love for God means true hatred of sin. In Matthew 7 and in Luke 13, Jesus says that many will be telling him on that day that he is the actual Lord of their life, but he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Your professed faith in Jesus means absolutely nothing. You say, well, you know, Nate, you really can't just judge a book by its cover. Well, I heard a great preacher recently say that that whole idea is really an invent of Satan because Jesus said you can judge a book by its cover because in John 15 he said you will know false prophets by their fruit. Tell me, how long would it actually take you if you walked up to an apple tree and there were fruits of apples all over it for you to say that it was an apple tree. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire. No one has to hear what you've been through. No one has to know that at one point you got saved. All they have to do is look at your fruit. You've been serving in church your whole life but look at your fruit for a second. What are the things that come out of your mouth when you talk to people in conversation? What are your affections set toward? Are they God things? You can tell him that you've served in church. You can tell him that he's Lord. But if you die without bearing Christ's fruits, you will go to hell for all of eternity. And 10 million years will pass. And you'll be under the weight of this thing that no human on earth can bear for even a second. And it'll be like no time has passed in eternity. No time. 100 million years passes and... It's the same. You're there. There you are suffering the wrath of God because you believe some lying preacher that was a wolf in sheep's clothing that just tried to encourage you. And so you may be saying, as many already have, hey, you're judgmental, you're unchristlike, you're condescending, you're heavy, you're turning people off by the way that you talk. Can't you see that I want you to live? That is the main purpose of your existence, to live. That is God's number one desire. The biggest problem in the Bible, if you would read it, that God is faced with is that if He is just, he cannot forgive you. Go talk to the lost people on the streets and see if they don't tell you that God is forgiving. They've heard of the tremendous love of God and yet they're still in love with the very sin that crushed and murdered him. And so are many of you. Hey, let's watch a movie tonight. What, there's nudity and there's 12 GDs? 140 F words? That's alright. I, I have freedom in Christ. Freedom from what? Freedom to let some of the worst words that can spill out of a human mouth serve as your entertainment? And yet you still claim that you love Him with your whole heart? You make lighthearted gestures at the very things that murdered Him? And not only that, but you spit in the bloody face of the Lamb of God as He hangs on the jagged wood, taking your wrath. And you say, don't worry. He forgives. Do you know the character of the God you serve? In the book of Jeremiah, God's people have been wicked by serving other gods and having their affections set on other things and willfully sinning and not saying that they had sinned and not acknowledging their need for God. So we find Jeremiah in chapter 14 repenting, genuine biblical repentance for the people of God. And he said, Lord, we confess our wickedness and that of our ancestors too. We have all sinned against you. For the sake of your reputation, Lord, do not abandon us. Do not disgrace your own glorious throne. Please remember us and do not break your covenant with us. It's really good repentance. It's really genuine. It's better than what most of you have prayed. But what may shock you is God's response. Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me pleading for these people, I wouldn't help them. Away with them. Get them out of my sight. Then he told Jeremiah, do not go to funerals to mourn and show sympathy for these people, for I have removed my peace and my protection from them. I have taken away my unfailing love and mercy. These weren't the lost people of the world, these were his people. So you may be questioning, Nate, why are you saying this? To me, you still sound judgmental. Well, I heard a story of a young man that was dying on his deathbed and his brother was there next to him. And he said, brother, 
Why have you been so indifferent to me about my soul as you have been? And his brother said, indifferent? I haven't been indifferent to you. I, I've spoken to you often about it. And the brother said, yeah, you've spoken. But I think that if you would have remembered that I was going down to hell, you would have been more earnest with me. Every time you hear a sermon and you see a video or you hear a song that's convicting or anything, you have a chance to either repent or to harden your heart. Some of you have watched a video that I've made in the past and you've thought, man, that's really good. Or, or maybe you've told me, hey, I'm going to start changing. Thank you for this and this. But you really haven't decided to go ahead and change and tap into the grace of God. You're hardening your heart against Him. You're making it harder for yourself. Don't make your judgment twice as bad for hearing the word of the Lord and then ignoring it. I'm telling you about hell and I'm telling you that some of you are going to go there unless you repent. But if you harden your heart and you live your whole life and you die and go to hell without repenting, you will look back on the day that you watch this video and from the flames of hell you will curse you will curse the day you were born you will curse this day and you will say I wish I had never even watched that because now I know that he was right now I know that this hell is real that he wasn't just trying to scare me and that I was going I was going to burn there for all of eternity now I see the truth now I see I've got to tell you something very solemn there's nothing in this life that you can do that will take away glory from God. And in the end, He will be glorified in your life. There's a verse of scripture that talks about how for all of eternity, the lake of fire will be open for people to come and see the fierce wrath of God. And they will be able to observe how majestic He is and they will see it with awe in their hearts and they will come back and worship Him. The Lion of God who stomps His enemies until their blood sprinkles all of His robes, they will come bow before Him and say, Holy. Holy, holy is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But you know what mercy is? Mercy is that you can choose. And so you choose. Will God be glorified by your damnation and eternal punishment? Or will He be glorified by your salvation and your worship? I realize that a lot of you think I'm crazy. I, I was told that. But just ask yourself, what is going to matter when you or on your deathbed if you get one? And when you're just a few breaths away from death, what is going to matter is it going to matter whether or not you've graduated from college? No. Is it going to matter whether or not I've written a song or whether or not I've uh, painted a picture or done anything? Nothing's going to matter when your breath's away from eternity. Don't you think that you'll wish when that time comes that you had really loved God the way you said you did? That you'd actually flip the TV off a little more to study His God-breathed scriptures? I know I will. No matter how much I've done it, I'll know that I wish I would have done it more. But the good news is... Christ is calling. He's calling loud. Wisdom is calling out in the streets. He's calling for you to come. He is holding the door of mercy as wide open as it can go. And He is saying, come and dine with me. To dine with Him, you have to die to you. The one whose name you abuse and whose cross you mock by the way that you live is alive and He's coming. But you may die before He does. All you have is now.